Imagine a simple, cost-effective solution to famine and malnutrition that would allow most people in the world to feed themselves and reduce their ecological footprint while doing it. Sounds like asking for a miracle, but it is exactly what one biotech startup hopes to accomplish. The company is called Spira, and Elliot Roth is its founder and CEO, and he joins us now on the line from Washington, D.C. to explain. Elliot, it's good to meet you, and let's start right from scratch. What is Spira? So Spira is a microalgae company. We are a vertically integrated algae company that grows and sells nutritional products using algae. Where'd you come up with the idea? <laughs> so um, just like any, any college student, I was subsisting on mostly ramen, and I wanted to figure out a new kind of way to get nutrition. And I figured that I could grow it myself. And so I was subsisting on a, on a really minimal diet, and I looked into what NASA was doing, and I found out that they were growing spirulina algae. And they grow it in a tiny, tiny footprint, and I figured if it was good enough for astronauts, it was probably good enough for me. And so I started growing it and putting it together in a laboratory um, that I built myself while in school. And in fact, was it good enough for you? <laughs> yeah, so uh, spirulina is a tiny single-celled organism. It's about 60% protein by weight. That's fully double that of anything else on the planet. Uh, it also has most of the micronutrients you need for your daily diet, so 13 vitamins, 8 minerals. But the best part of it all is that it doubles every single day. And all it really needs is air, water, light, and a few simple salts to grow. So it's really, really simple to grow, eat, consume, and uh, use. Uh, okay, fair enough, but most, uh, do I have this right? You're 23, is that right? 23 years old? Yes, yes. Okay, most 23-year-olds, if they happen upon something like that, might think, okay, this is cool, this will get me through university or whatever. They don't necessarily think, wow, I may have found the cure for global hunger. Where did that next step in the process come from? Well, so because I was growing it so simply and easily, I wanted to enable other people to grow it themselves. Uh, spirulina is in incredible at, at growth. So with about a thousand liters at peak capacity, it can become the entire mass of the world's oceans in about three months. But it's not a kind of like attack of the killer tomatoes type situation. It's only at very specific conditions. And so I, I leveraged my background in biomedical engineering as a means of trying to solve the bottom rung of Maslow's hierarchy. I wanted to figure out how to tackle physiological needs of people as a means of self-actualizing all the communities in the developing world who don't necessarily have a chance to really achieve their full potential. And so I took a look at what was required in order to solve those physiological needs. And I realized that food was a majority, one of, one of the main parts. Uh, so started growing it and serving it, sampling it around the community, and uh, we got a little bit of attention. So I ended up going into a few accelerator programs. One of them was in Ireland, where I spent three months refining the technology at Rebel Bio, which is the largest biotech investor by volume. And then after that, came back to Richmond, Virginia, where I'm based in Lighthouse Labs, refined the business model, uh, started selling products, um, and eventually uh, spoke at South by Southwest, Synbio Beta, went all over the world, and it's been, it's been a lot of fun. Now, I must confess, I'm not much of a foodie here, Elliot, so you're going to have to help me. What, what does what your spirulina actually look like? Uh, so think of it kind of like blended avocado. Um, it's really uh, minimal in taste. It really doesn't taste like much of anything at all. Uh, conventionally, it's sold as a powder or a pill. But we realize that these are like these bitter tasting compounds and taste is 50% of what really conveys to people that, that a product is worthwhile and good. Um, so what we wanted to do is not only have a healthy product, but have something that was actually tasty. So we made a live culture drink uh, that has mostly protein and a good deal of iron, which solves the problem of anemia, which is a prevalent health condition even in the developed world where 10% of all the females in the U.S. have anemia in some kind of way. Hmm. So we present it as this prebiotic, delicious beverage, kind of like uh, green kombucha. And have you done what most of the big food companies done, namely added a ton of sugar to it so that it tastes better? No, not at all, not at all. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do was convey a kind of like fresh alternative, uh, something that really doesn't need all too, altogether too much flavor. Uh, so we flavor it with a, a variety of different things, uh, primarily watermelon, strawberry right now, uh, but we're working on a number of other flavors. And you can have any color you want, so long as it's green. <laughs> any color you want as long as it's green, got it, okay. 
Corporately speaking, where are you right now in the development of getting this idea out there? So we launched uh, two products recently. So one of them is an at-home kit where you can grow 10 to 20 grams of spirulina yourself. And so you can order one of those online at livespira.com. Uh, and that kit passed the mom test. So I ended up testing it out on my parents. And if it can pass something like that, I figure anybody else can really grow it. And they mix it in with their eggs, and they use it in their pancakes and have green eggs and ham uh, virtually every single morning. Uh, our other product that we ended up launching in the local market around Richmond is that live culture drink. And we're trying to raise some money right now as a means of going um, into other markets and retail stores with that beverage. Uh, for the really uh, part of the business that I think I, I personally really mesh with and care about is the social impact piece. Uh, so we just returned from Munich, Germany, where we were working with the World Food Program on a project in the developing world, particularly in Chad. Hmm. Now, if you want people to grow this algae at home and basically you know, do your own thing, what do you grow it in? Um, so right now, we've been repurposing people's old aquarium tanks. Um, so if you have a fish that you haven't been altogether too careful with and had to flush the poor fishy down the toilet, you can reuse that aquarium tank to, to grow your own nutrition. Uh, just make sure you clean it first. Okay, gotcha. Let's talk about some of the actual health impacts that you hope to have with this. And again, let's start really from scratch here. A microbe, what is a microbe? So a microbe is a single-celled organism that grows incredibly quickly. Uh, think of it kind of like those uh, probiotic, prebiotic, prebiotic mixes that uh, are really good for your gut. So that's, that's what a micro is, just a single-celled organism. And how important are they to human health? So in, to put it in context, uh, you, only, you have about one trillion cells in your body. You have about 10 trillion microbes in your body in some kind of way, 10 times the amount of normal cells. And scientists think that these microbes are, are, affect all sorts of different aspects of your health, ranging from your gut health to your mental health to all sorts of different things. So if you can sort of nail the microbe angle on this, the theory anyway is that you can really put a dent in malnutrition around the world, have I got that right? Yes, yeah, so the idea is to enable people to have access to nutrition everywhere, virtually effortlessly. Um, the ability to grow your own and cater your own uh, microbiome and microbes to make it so that you don't have to worry about where nutrition is from and don't have to take that weekly trip to the grocery store anymore. And what makes you think that your product is sort of uh, the best candidate to handle this issue? So. Spirulina is the most efficient means of producing protein um, with virtually any other food product. And so by producing it locally, we can also cut down on massive amounts of carbon emissions and enable uh, everyone everywhere to just get really fresh, nutritionally dense protein, uh, which is a virtually tasteless additive that you can add to, to anything that you're already doing. And, you know, this may seem like a pretty obvious question, but let me try it anyway here. What makes you think people are going to want to grow algae in their homes? <laughs> um, so a couple of different reasons. One, it gives you more control uh, over your own nutrition. Two, it's that self-reliance aspect, the idea that you don't necessarily have to go to the store or rely on anybody else in order to provide for yourself in some kind of way. And three, I think um, a lot of the systems are moving more locally uh, in which we really expect farmers to produce food nearer to us so that we actually know where it's coming from. So it might not be you yourself that's producing the spirulina, but it might be somebody down the street from you. And so uh, if you're in the neighborhood, come drop on by and say hi. <laughs> okay, now Elliot, I know I can have it in any color I want as long as the color is green. I understand that. The next thing we need to know, of course, is how it tastes. How does it taste? So spirulina just by itself, when it's fresh, is virtually tasteless. That's part of the reason why we have it as a live culture drink, so that it really doesn't taste like much of anything at all, and we can flavor it in a bunch of different ways. One of the things the company has been practicing, which is kind of interesting, is a concept that the soft drink industry coined called sensory-specific satiety. And what that really means is, uh, when I say Coke, what kind of flavor is Coke? It's virtually Coke flavored, right? You don't really know what kind of flavor Coke is. And so we can do the same kind of thing with algae because people aren't very familiar with the taste of algae. And by presenting an unfamiliar food, uh, but something that has been grown for millennia in a way that is more conventionally acceptable, 
by people, we can enable uh, a kind of familiarity with whatever the new flavor is. Hmm. And is the priority here kind of to feed the world, particularly the developing world, or are you more anxious to sort of compete with Kraft and other big food makers here in North America? So I think uh, just as an emblematic of my generation, we try to balance both uh, the business aspect with the social impact aspect. Uh, we really want to do well by doing good. And so we're implementing a kind of buy one, give one system for every bit purchased um, from our company, we are going to uh, donate part of the proceeds to uh, projects in the developing world that we're working on, particularly in Chad and with the World Food Program. Well, obviously, this is a, a, a huge dream that potentially could have an enormous impact. And I guess, um, let's finish up on this. What do you think the biggest obstacle to making this dream of yours come true is? Ooh, very good question. Um, I think it primarily is with uh, consumer behavior and acceptance. Um, a lot of people are just very unfamiliar with uh, spirulina and other forms of microalgae. Um, the kind of barrier to entry is they, they think of algae as the thing growing in their pool, not necessarily as something they eat. And just like um, how lobster used to be fed to prisoners hundreds of years ago, I think algae will become more and more of a cultural trend, similar in nature to kale, and that we'll see more of a consumer acceptance of this as we go along when people realize just how good it is and how, how delicious it really tastes. Elliot, have you ever seen the movie Soylent Green? <laughs> yes, yes, I have. Uh, okay, for those who haven't seen it, I'm not going to give away the ending, but, uh, and frankly, it has nothing to do with what we're talking about today. Well, maybe just a little bit. Anyway, all in fun. Elliot Roth, it's awfully good of you to spend time with us on TVO tonight. You are the CEO of Spira, and we look forward to hearing more about this most interesting venture of yours. Thanks for joining us from Washington, D.C. Thank you so much, Steve. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.